Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theatre Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanov. If you've listened to the podcast before, you know I love talking to people from all over the globe. You know, I've, I've spoken with people in the US, Canada, UK, Mexico, China, Germany, and of course, Australia. Well, it's time to head down under once again. And today we are, are talking with director and producer, Neil Gooding. Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jean-Paul. How are you going? Good, good. So I start every one of my interviews the same way. I want to know who Neil is in 30 seconds. Give us the Neil Gooding bio in 30 seconds. Uh, I guess I'm a, a bit of a theatre nerd that grew up in a, a small town in Australia with a great theatre and sort of spent most of my younger life either in that theatre or doing theatre shows and then went and studied law commerce to keep my parents happy and then found my way uh, back to theatre. I guess that's the, that's the, that's the snapshot. <laughs> nice. Well, you've got another 12 seconds. Do you want to fill it with anything or, or that's the thing? Well, no, then I guess it's a, it's a juggle between uh, balancing a directing and producing career yeah. and, um, and now the balance between doing that overseas and in Australia and, and, and focusing more on New York. So I, I want to take it back. You, you mentioned that uh, you, you've been with theater and musicals when you were a kid, obviously. Was that, was that something that was ingrained in the family or were you the black sheep? Of, of no. So what happened, I, I grew up in a town of 10,000 people and uh, Australia, for, for a country with small populations in these towns, is incredibly, incredibly well resourced for theaters. So my hometown had a, a 530 seat proscenium arch theater with fly towers and so it was crazy so like our school musical we might do four performances and 20 percent of the town has seen that, that that school musical um and so my parents uh my, my father has been in you know like community shows at home but it was more that they were involved in the theater like on either on the board or they would be volunteer ushers yeah. Uh, but what it meant was that I grew up in that theatre, essentially. Like every show that toured through, I saw everything. Uh, like I said, we had the, the extremely, looking back on it, luxurious situation of my school musicals and my lo local youth theatre company shows. We were in this amazing theatre that we just took for granted. And it's only, yeah. when, it's only when I went to Brisbane and then Sydney that you go, oh, we were really spoiled <laughs> in, in that <laughs> Uh, so, so no, I guess I was kind of the black sheep in terms of anybody that that wanted to actually make theatre as a as a as a career, uh, but with very very theatre friendly and theatre supportive parents. Nice, yeah, you got you got to have those when you when you go into that business because. So, you, well, having said that, they made me go and do law commerce to make sure <laughs> to, to, to make sure that I didn't just run away and be an actor with no income. They they did make me do a degree before I could follow that pathway. <laughs> nice. So, so when when you went when when you went off to get your your, your degree in commerce, were was it were you still doing some theater in the background, or was was it more concentrating on that? You went from theater to that, and then back again. To, to no, I think it's fair to say that my university studies were very compromised by. <laughs> um, so, so I did. So I did extremely well during uh, during high school, um, and was very used to getting all my straight A's. Yeah. And then, and then had to shift my um, expectations and perspective because I was doing four or five or six productions a year, like as as an wow. a, as an actor, uh, which was absolutely formative and brilliant. But it also meant that my my legal and uh commerce uh results were adequate to pass let's put it yeah. that <laughs> I, I, it was unlikely that i was going to get picked up as the star law student of the university of queensland <laughs> in the in the mid 90s i'm gonna say <laughs> were you able to take some of those acting skills and parlay them into to your the the program you're in uh look everybody i mean i guess there, there was a big crossover particularly in australia and i, I guess it would be here between actors and comedians that actually have law degrees mm -hmm. um so I, I actually think it works the other way i think everybody looks at barristers and and you know litigators and goes well it's, th it's this, this acting skill that they have to stand up in court and then i've always thought it's the other way around there's something about there's something about people that are studying for law that seem to become really good comedians and writers <laughs> and and can't wait to get out of the law so, <laughs> so i think so i think it's the, the reverse way so, so we, we've taken you through high school uh, to to your degree, 
So after that, when, when, what transitioned you back into the theater world? Or did, did you do a bit of law and, and, and economics and then go theater? Or is it you just woke up and went, I want to go back into theater? No, well, I kind of feel like I never left. And I was okay. placating, I was placating my parents. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but during university, it was very much a, an amateur and community, you yeah. know, like I, it, it's not like I was getting paid to be a performer during the, the, when I was 18, 19, 20. Yeah. Um, so what actually happened was I got my commerce degree after three years of study and, and had two more years left to get my law degree. But once I got my first degree, I basically said to my parents, right, I've got the degree. Uh, I am getting on a train. Well, actually what happened was I went to North Queensland and I picked mangoes for three months okay. to be able to have any money to set up a new life. And then I, then I got on the train with about $2,000 in my pocket and one suitcase of the worst clothes you've ever seen from the mid nineties. And, uh, or, and, and I um, went to Sydney and basically said to my parents, I, this is it. I'm going to go be an actor in Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, but what actually happened when I arrived in Sydney was a friend of mine from Brisbane had been working for uh, the producers of Beauty and the Beast in Australia. So within a week, I ended up working on Beauty and the Beast in the um, administration office, like doing group sales and ticketing and that, that company that I worked for there, I, I was with them for the better part of the next decade, uh, working on the, like all the financial and administrative side of shows, and I guess towards producing and learning the ropes, and um, and that was kind of how it all sort of played out. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you still do acting and performing? Oh or- heck no, no. I okay. uh, I mean I got to I did. There was a few years where I was juggling both. Like in yeah. Sydney, I was auditioning. I did a couple of bits and pieces, and then as I moved more into the producing and directing side, uh, I, I had the opportunity to sit in many auditions that I was holding, and it became very clear to me watching the mistakes that people made when they came into the audition room that I was looking at people that were amazing in the audition room and people that weren't quite as amazing. And I looked at them and went, oh, I know which one of those I am. (laughs) (laughs) And I should stay on this side of the table. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, I I have those moments too. (laughs) I I haven't been on stage in a while and I'm like, yeah, they're, they're better than I am. Yeah, and now it's at a point where, and I did love it, like up to the age of about 24, 25, it's really all I could imagine doing. And and when I produced and directed my first show, I I fell in love with Assassins. I found the CD of Assassins Mm -hmm. by Stephen Sondheim, got the script and just something within me said, I can see that show or my version of that show in my head and I want to do my version. But I was also arrogant enough at the age of 24 to, um, to... say well i'm going to produce it i'm going to direct it and i am clearly the best option for john wilkes booth that has no, 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 not, for booth, not, not for booth sorry for um for lee harvey oswald that has ever existed and so um so so that was that was a kind of the point when i went that's enough producing directing yeah. and acting and I'll, I'll stick to the other the other things and i've never really missed it it's always been one of the mysteries of my life that's something that i that i really really strove for 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 a long time and particularly growing up in a small town between the age of 15 and 25 that really was the only thing I could imagine doing and it's always been a surprise to me that I when I found something else that I enjoyed more that I have never really gone you know what I need to do is pick up a script and sing in front of an audience or or whatever that looks like (laughs) yeah there's always that moment um when you you we realize it's it's not the love of being on stage it's love of being in the theater itself and being around theater it didn't matter you know whether you're on stage off stage or whatever it's it's that's the love that you have is for and, and i always when i look back because i do quite a lot of um teaching and cl- master classes mm-hmm. now when i look back on it what i've realized is I, I i mean i enjoyed performing but what i enjoyed was the rehearsing like the, the rehearsals and putting shows mm-hmm. together yes. and that process was much more interesting to me than than then standing up on stage and delivering the show multiple times so. yeah exactly nice so so you you've you've moved you've moved to sydney you said right at this yes. point yeah you got a suitcase full of mangoes and 90s clothes <laughs> and <laughs> so um when did you uh decide to start uh, your your production company yeah well that that was really when i found assassin so that was the year okay. two th- that was 2000 or, or, or probably the end of 1999 into 2000 um and it was just through necessity 
Mm-hmm. Honestly, like I, I, I haven't really thought that much about directing in as, as a career. Yeah. I, ha- I hadn't really thought about producing my own stuff. And then when I got, when I found that show and decided I wanted to do it and I knew some friends that were perfect in a few of those roles. And since then they've become the leading, some of the leading musical theater performers in Australia, luckily for me. So yeah. it was a good, it was a good crop of friends to sort of hang around with. Um, and then, and then all the business side of it just sort of flowed. Cause I've always, I've always had a business brain and, and, um, and, you know, in another lifetime would have been quite happy being a financial planner or do it or, you know, something like that. So, mm-hmm. so an investment manager. So um, yeah, setting up a company and, it was it was particularly wasn't particularly glamorous. It was just something that I needed to do, and then everything sort of kept growing out of that. Nice, and and so you you, you put on assassins, and and the impetus for the for the Neil Gooding Productions company started. When did you um, start looking at uh, other shows, uh, new musicals, and things like that? Because I because I've been on your website, and you've got now you've got all these other shows that that you uh, represent. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's like, like everything in this industry, I find as I get older and actually have some time to look back. Because at the time, when you're just paddling madly to do whatever yeah. you do, you don't get to think about it. So one of my cast members in Assassins was a guy called James Miller, who uh, played Miss Trunchbull, but Miss Trunchbull in Australia in Matilda. And okay. has had, has had a, but he wrote a show called... So after we did Assassins, he went off to Whopper, which is... Uh, one of the the premier training courses in Australia for musical theatre. And during his time at Whopper, he met a guy called Peter Rutherford and they wrote the first drafts of this show called The Hat Pin. And and so James called me and said, I have this show that I'm playing with. Would you be interested in taking a look? And the first draft, and since then, James, I mean, they, they were they've become pretty much one of Australia's premier musical theatre writing teams. And James is one of Australia's best book writers and lyricists. At the time, we had no idea what anybody was doing anything. Um, and, um, and so he sent me the hat pin, which was based on this true Australian crime that happened. And it was the best first draft of anything I've ever read still. Um, and it was missing its final 15 pages, which if, if, you, if, if anyone that knows the show, that's that's the crucial part of figuring out how this story resolves um and so over the next two years we sort of took a development process for the hat pin of just getting all their friends from whopper around at kitchen tables and reading the show because australia uh particularly 15 years ago had very very unresourced ad hoc ways to develop musical theater um it's getting better now but we still i mean we're still miles behind yeah. the USA and the UK, but it's getting better all the time. Um, and partly I, for my, per, me personally, I, I trace that back to the hat pin. Cause I go that, that show, we got it on stage in, in um, 19, uh, in 2008 in Sydney. Uh, and at that point it would have been one of the first Australian musicals with an original score to have been on stage on that scale for quite a while. Um, and at the time, I didn't realise quite how groundbreaking that was. Again, we, we, we were just doing it and raised the money and got it on. Uh, that came over to Nymph in 2009. Um, and then basically from that point, I became the guy that could get an Australian musical onto stage. And I was suddenly inundated with everybody that had a musical in their bottom drawer or yeah. younger, younger writers. So the generation of um, James and Peter also includes... Uh, Matthew Robinson, Matthew Lee Robinson, who's now over here working on Atlantis. Um, it, it's uh, I worked on the works of uh, Dean Bright and Matthew Frank, um, Anthony Cassette. There was a whole generation of these younger Australian writers. Yeah. Um, and suddenly they were all bringing me works. And and we in, in the background, we were trying to figure out a way of actually having some viability for how you, how you actually develop those shows. Because it's pretty much just a, a, a bottomless pit of, <laughs> of money to throw at <laughs> yes. in Australia. Um, and, and so that led to uh, the formation of a, a thing that became it was called New, New Musicals Australia, where we did get some government funding with Chris Stewart, who set up uh, the New York Music Theatre Festival, and I did that. And then that sort of flowed onto this small theatre company in Sydney now called the Hayes Theatre, which is sort of a version of off-Broadway. So I, I, I always, when I get chance to sit back and think about it now, I, I am always a bit surprised about how how the pieces fit together and how the dots join. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, 
ironically now, when you when you ask the question about the, the Australian musicals that I do, or, and even over here, the, I, I tend to work on new musicals these days, mm-hmm. uh, and it all traces back to a production of Assassins at, at, a, at a small <laughs> university theatre in Sydney because that, that group of people uh, became lifelong collaborators and that spurned a whole heap of other projects and that project, the hat pin, led to another couple of Australian musicals and then that led to, yeah, so it just flows yeah. on in a way you could never, ever predict when we were 23, no. you know, how that would happen. So Nice. Yeah, and we play the hat pin on the on the station. It's one of our, that, that we uh, promote because it's a great, great show. Amazing show. It's a show that I wish, like, like, like the problem I said with Australian musicals is that it's very hard to get, even when we, because about 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I was testing the theory in Australia of going, what happens if we do recordings mm-hmm. that are at the same standard as off-Broadway, Broadway recordings? Yeah. Is, that, is that enough to get prominence to those shows and get enough people to know them so that they will do, they will license the show? And the answer is kind of no, sadly. Like, uh, you know, we, we've, um, so I think there's a crop of shows that we've developed in Australia that are really great and they should be licensed a lot more mm-hmm. and and i guess we're all sort of waiting for this point in time when you go is there ever going to be a chance to let people know that show exists because i think once people that know it or see it they are big fans of that show but there's just that you know they're, they're, but they're more likely to pick up a song cycle that was done off broadway for three weeks um and and so that and that's just the the, the, the nature of being from australia i guess in musical theater well and and that's why i've, I've got on our sampler platter show about I think four or five Australian shows because there's all shows I've never heard of over here in, in Canada, but you know, obviously you've heard of them <laughs> because yeah. you, know, you produce some of them. And, and that's, that's been my goal is to help promote and, and recognize global musicals because, yeah. you know, obviously they deserve to be heard and, and known. And also we, you know, we're a country that is small, but mm-hmm. we've, we always do very high quality professional musical theater, like when we import stuff, but, We've always had, uh, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, world-class writers. And now they're starting to come. So, so Eddie Perfect wrote the score for Beetlejuice and Tim Minchin wrote Matilda and Groundhog Day. And, um, and you know, Matthew Robinson is now living in New York. And I think it won't be long before there's a show he writes that everyone goes, oh, that's so, so you know, the, that, that generation of people I got to work with mm-hmm. uh, are probably also the first generation of Australian writers that have been able to break outside the shores of Australia and, I think there will definitely be shows that the world goes, oh, that's an Australian musical theatre writer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Having, having said that, part of my move to New York was also going, there's also a whole world of writers that I want to write with. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and there's no doubt that as difficult as it is um, developing and working on a new musical in New York, it's vastly easier than it is in Australia. So let's let's move on to that. So you're you're in New York right now. Uh, you said yes. you moved there. I think we talked off air about eighteen months ago. Give or yeah, take. full time. Yeah, I've been I've been coming over quite a lot for different projects. Mm-hmm. I was either uh, directing or producing, but yeah, sort of eighteen months ago, made the decision to let's see what happens if I just move full time. So, which has been an amazing time to do it because COVID has really helped with that. <laughs> that, car- that career trajectory has been amazing for the last year. <laughs> I know. Perfect timing. Beautiful. I know. <laughs> so, so what, what was your first um, project outside of Australia? Uh, Cause I've, I've seen you've done stuff in the UK and New York and things like that. What was the first moment that you were doing producing? And, and- uh, so that all, that all started happening. So I had, I wrote a show when I was 23 called back to the eighties, which is mm-hmm. a, a, like a, an eighties catalog musical that just happened to ride the wave of the eighties and happened yeah. to be one one of the first jukebox shows. Um, so that started getting performed around the world. And I guess opened up some network of people that I started mm-hmm. knowing, but, but really it was about 2009. In 2009, we bought the hat pin to Nymph. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was a co-producer on an Australian play called Holding the Man in the West End. And that was really the start of that process. Because once, once you, again, once you do jump outside of Australia and start putting on shows and meeting people, everybody wants you know collaborators well as long as people like you i guess i like yeah, your work <laughs> um then then i then i have found that generally the the ball starts rolling pretty quickly and and people start contacting you saying i've got this show and then the process becomes going through 50 projects and going no 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 and finding the one the one gem yeah. um in a directing sense i came to new york in about 
three years ago to be the um, assistant director of church and state that played at New World Stages off mm-hmm. Broadway. Um, and like I said, it's always been this juggle for me about trying to balance a directing career and a producing career. And it never, it never works out perfectly. Um, and on some shows, particularly smaller scale shows in Australia, you can, you can do both. You, but but that, that pretty much stops once shows get big enough that you go pick, pick one or the other. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, so, and, and then I guess over the last few years, it got to a point where I felt like I was working on more projects over here than I was in, in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was keen to sort of go, well, let's, let's move to New York, see what happens. And, you know, again, my theory was the world, traveling around the world is not, is not, not difficult. You just get on a plane flight and, yeah. <laughs> and you go back to Australia or you go to London and then um, 2020 had other ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I've still been able to sort of make it work. Like I've, I've got a project in Australia premiering in February called um, Drummer Queens, which is an all female percussion show along the lines of a, a stomp or a blue man group. Cool. Um, so that's kind of risen up during COVID. And that also means that I now get to, you know, f- scramble for the flights that are available to Australia, which is very few. And then, qu- and then quarantine in hotels <laughs> over and over. But, um, you know, I, I really, I mean, I'm desperately hanging out for this point where the, where the vaccine k- kicks yes. in and the world starts opening up again. Cause for me personally, I, I do need to have a fair bit of access to Australia and London and, and New York and, and around America. So, yeah. um, and, and I need audiences <laughs> and, people <that> want, <laughs> and, and, and people that want to go and sit in a the theater and, and pay for money to watch the show. So, so uh, 2020 will not go down as a, as a high point in, in, no. in, in uh, my, my, my theatrical career. But now you've been working, like you said, you worked in the UK and in New York and Australia. Do, do you find there's a difference in the way uh, things are done in in the UK and New York compared to Australia, or is it pretty much standardized the way producing works and directing works and and, and people? Uh, I think the actual producing and directing is similar. I mean, one one disadvantage that Australia has, and particularly in major musicals, is uh, and it's one of the reasons that we don't have a great domestic musical market is mm-hmm. we, we have spent decades importing shows. So, so, and by the time we import a show, it has generally become a big hit. So by the time we bring in Wicked, it's a hit. And by the time we bring in Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis and Book of Mormon, it's a hit. And so where that becomes um, problematic for somebody like me that is trying to convince governments and investors and everybody else to you know, invest time and money and resources into developing musicals mm-hmm. is they don't really have a good understanding of it because they think that every musical you're working on is a commercial hit that's going to make millions of dollars. Yeah. And, and they don't see the, the, the 99 other shows that didn't become Wicked and the 99 other shows that didn't become the Book of Mormon. No. Um, so that, that developing structure, which I spend a lot of my life doing, that... I mean, I love it in Australia and I feel like we have absolutely moved the dial forward in the last 10 years in particular and that the government is certainly getting more on board with that process and how that works. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's no doubt about the fact that that's a much easier process in London and particularly in New York. I mean, New York is so sophisticated at, at, at developing new shows and you know, finding resources to, to make them work. And there's a lot of producers that are going to look at new works to because because the difference here is the workshop of Dear Evan Hansen may become Dear Evan Hansen in two years. You know, and and, and the workshop of Hades Town yeah. could become Hades Town in two years, or it could be one of the other 50 shows that isn't going to make it to yeah. Broadway. But but that's that's the difference is that you're not you're not putting a show on and going, well, oh, we're just doing four weeks in a small theater in Sydney, and that's the that's the end game for this show because there's not really a pathway to move it forward. Mm-hmm. Um, that culture here that goes before Wicked was Wicked it was a workshop in a room that we saw and before rent became rent, it was a New York theater workshop. That, that is something that will take a lot of time for Australia to develop to a point, but, but you know, like I said, I, I think there's a lot of promising signs over there. Um, I think the producing is, is kind of the same, you know, you're, you're always at the mercy of theaters and you're always yeah. at the mercy of raising money. Uh, the other big difference in Australia is uh, we don't have a London and we don't have a, a New York where you can capitalize a show yeah. and you sit in the theater. And if you're, if you're wicked 15 years later, you are still sitting in the same theater. So we have the, we have a, a tyranny of distance between our cities and not many major cities and, and a relatively small population. So 
only certain shows work in Australia. So something like Wicked has done a couple of tours, but you know, you play in Sydney for maybe six months and then you have to pay one and a half million dollars to move that entire show to <laughs> Melbourne and go into a new theater and have an entirely new marketing campaign in a, in a new city. Um, and so that becomes problematic for, for the finances of how shows are done. And what it also leads to um, is that we don't really have a medium size market for that. So something like Dear Evan Hansen or Spring Awakening or Next to Normal or You're in Town, they, there is no particularly accessible commercial touring model for that. So, so quite often that becomes the domain of either our nonprofit theatre companies who don't really work together that often and, and don't do musicals that often or it becomes something that will end up in a, in a 150 seat theater or hundred seat theater in a, in a, uh, a non-professional production. So, so the, you know, the, the genre of shows that I love, and, and this actually is the other reason I moved to New York is I, I sort of look at five or eight years ago when shows like next to normal and fun home and we're becoming Tony award winning hits yeah. and D Evan Hansen and Hades town. And, and I go, well, that's, that's my kind of show. Mm-hmm. But in but in an environment where that becomes that is the commercial hit of the year, like you don't have to be Pretty Woman the musical to survive um, in New York, uh, and that and that excited me because I, I went well. Suddenly these shows are are plays with music, which I love, and they're they're, they're character based and drama driven, and then somehow that becomes the most popular show in New York, <laughs> and um and that that's exciting. Nice. It, 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 every, the more you talk, the more parallels I see between Canada and, and, and Australia with the way everything's going and we're spread out, the population and, and trying to establish ourselves and, and all that sort of thing. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And I see that a lot here as well. And as, as Australians, we get told that we are almost identical to Irish and Canadians. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not shocked that, uh, that our countries are very similar in that way. <laughs> Well, I think it's a compliment on both sides if we get compared to each other, because I think we're both fantastic. So, <laughs> and, and Australia has almost no coronavirus at this point in time. So, so some, something's happening right down there. I would like to say the same with us, but uh, there's <laughs> dumb people out there just. But we'll just leave that to be. So. I, I think it. I think it helps when you're a big island in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that that certainly helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get. A oh, Newfoundland is the perfect example for us. It, it's like our Australia. Nobody can get onto it. You know, it's it's isolated. So very few cases over there. But. Yes. Yeah. Nice. So what do you see in the in the future when when the theaters come back open? Where do you see yourself? What do you what do you think you'll be doing? Well, I, I th- there is a play that um that I will have off Broadway as soon as um as soon as off Broadway is allowed to open or or actually as soon as that theater is because it's going to be theater by theater I think about whether or not they meet the the COVID safety guidelines and what the requirements are uh so I I've been fairly lucky during COVID in the sense that so Dr- Drummer Queens is moving along in Australia and is on stage in February 2021 um so to have any project that, that has been able to be developed and will be on stage through COVID has been amazing uh and I'll have the play here and there's a few I'm working with um a couple of NYU writers on their new show that was their, their graduate piece from 2019. Nice. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of potential projects. I'm a, I'm a co-producer of um, Room, which will be reopening in Canada, I believe. It was um yes, it was supposed to be last, here. Yeah, it, it played it played in um, London and then and then that got shut down with uh with COVID. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of the co-producers of Back to the Future, which will be opening at the West End in March. Nice. So, so there's always that thing that I kind of split my time now between shows that I um, am the lead producer on and make all the decisions on and, and drive, which is sort of what I built a career doing in Australia. And then these other shows where I'm a co-producer where, you know, I, I, I don't make the day-to-day decisions on Back to the Future or, or Rune. So, yeah. so they kind of happen with my, you know, minimal involvement, and, but I'm excited to be part of them. Uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess we'll also be trying to pick which theater, uh, which countries are the most sensible place to do shows in. So right now you can do a full musical like Frozen and Pippin have just opened in Sydney. Um, uh, and like South Korea has, has shows running, but I guess it's going to be a bit opportunistic over the next year or two, because just, just waiting for Broadway to go, please come and do a show 
is going to be a bit of a fraught yeah. process because it's going to take time to open up and then there's a backlog of shows. And so, so I, I do think part of this year where 2020 may be shuffling the decks a little bit about how things work is that, you know, I, I think it will make Germany and, and London and Australia and South Korea, um, you know, much more viable yeah. alternatives where you can, we, we can run professional productions and, and have big audiences and, not necessarily always have this focus on it has to go to Broadway first and then it's going to be rolled out. And I think six has proven that. I mean, yes, six is the sure. six is the ultimate model of going, let's disrupt the Broadway focus <laughs> um, because whether or not it goes to Broadway, which clearly it is, but it's already a hit in many countries and it's on cruise ships. And, and that was all done within two years. Like it's been a remarkable rollout. Um, and so I, I, I hope that that model is going to be, a bit more prevalent because it, it would certainly be useful for small to medium shows that can be nimble and have audiences in other places that don't need the stamp of Broadway to go, hey world, you should do this show because it's been on Broadway or off Broadway. Yeah. Nice. Not, not to denigrate. Having said that, every show I have, I want to go to Broadway or off Broadway. <laughs> of I'm, course, not, yeah. I, I, I'm not I'm not saying I want to ignore New York, but uh but it just means that I think there's flexibility about where you where you where you can try out shows and, and do them. <clears throat> And for yeah. me particularly, I go, there's quite often going to be a time, I think, like Drummer Queens, where I go, my out-of-town tryout is Australia, or it's going to be some, somewhere that you go, it doesn't need to be another city in, in the USA, because you can do it much more cheaply in other countries and, and um, have the same level of brilliance in your, in your creative teams and your actors and things like that. So. For sure. Well, congratulations on, on getting that up and, and, and uh, all the stuff that you've been able to accomplish during 2020 and everything else that you've been able to, you know, bring to Australia and the rest of the world. Um, so thank you for uh, doing all that stuff. That's, that's This is how you look exhausted at 44. You just... <laughs> Actually, COVID, 2020 has been great for that. Like I, I, I personally feel like the year of slowing down a bit and recouping and just, you know, getting on top of emails that we're never going to get to. It has been amazing for that in some ways. Yeah. It's, I, if you ignore the rest of that stuff, if you just take the positive stuff, yes, I've been able to meet so many people and engage and, and spend the time to be able yeah. to get to know people. So yeah, we slowed down a little bit, but I think the one step back from closing the theaters and everything has given us, you know, an opportunity to propel ourselves forward and we've learned how to do digital stuff and, and meet yeah. people. So. And I do think it would lead to a massive influx of new shows. Like I think this, this, this breathing space that everybody's had to kind of clear their heads and clear mm -hmm. their emails and clear their calendars a bit. I, I know from my point of view, I go, I, I am bursting with projects. The only thing I'm waiting for now is going, when is there enough theaters yeah. available? And when is there enough audience members that want to go back and watch it to sustain that? But, and I, I think I know a lot of other producers like me, they're in the same boat. So you go, there's no shortage of, of product that could well flow into the marketplace over the next few years. Yeah. Well, uh, Neil, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me today and, and, and telling us about yourself and the shows that you did. It's been fantastic to meet you. Oh, same to you. And thank you for your support with, with shows like the hat pin and love bites. Like it was really, it was really great when I was in Australia, this great, moment to go oh at least there's going to be some airplay and some knowledge of it overseas so, so we, we really appreciated that not a problem but before we go i, I always ask my, my guests three questions now there's no right or wrong answer but one of them might have a wrong answer so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna find out all right so question number one who is your favorite creator or team when it comes to music lyrics or book or, or something like that what what you know who or what team you know, inspired you or, or do you just love with, with, a, with a passion or, or we should get to know. I, I would look at, I would look at certain shows that I love, but I, mm -hmm. I now tend to look at, again, I guess it's, it depends on where I sit in theater, but I go for me in, a, in, in the UK, it's Cameron McIntosh and what he did with his producing. Yeah. And for me in Australia, sorry, in Australia, in, in the USA, it's um, Jeffrey Seller and Kevin McCollum and what they did where in both cases they were taking unknown writers because mm -hmm. um, I think people tend to forget that Cameron McIntosh built his entire empire on a largely unknown Andrew Lloyd Webber and a largely unknown French writing team. Yeah. And Kevin McCollum and Jeffrey Seller here, I think their impact on Broadway is under acknowledged. 
And because, you know, when, when you deal with a young Lin Manuel Miranda and a young Bobby Lopez and a young, and, and they, t- they, they took all of these writers that were unknown with shows that were completely original and the, the flow on effect yes. of that is enormous. So, so I think in a producing sense, that's, they're my idols more than writers. Yeah. And, um, and then I've always had directing, like, you know, at the moment, John Tiffany, I think is just the best director in the world. And I, and I love Alex Timber's work and I love, you know, um, Trevor Nunn's work. So, so for me, it's t- they tend to sit more in the people that take the work that the writers have done and then, and then execute it on stage. Nice. That is a correct answer. <laughs> so that's one I, was right, I was right. That might've been the one that's, a, that's incorrect answer. So. <laughs> no, 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 we'll get to that one. Don't worry. <laughs> that's, that's correct. <laughs> All right. So question number two, as a director or producer, is there a show that you would love to get your hands on and, and be part of that production? You know, an old show, a new show. Is there anything that you would just want? You don't care if it makes money or not. You just would love to do it and be a part of it. Uh, I tend to, yes. The answer is yes, in terms of reimagining a few shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I tend to look more at things that have happened because my hope is always that what's in the future are shows that I will get to work on and develop. There are, however, times when I look back at sections of shows or entire shows and go, Oh, I wish that was my work. Like, like <laughs> how, how Prince's work on the original Levita, um, or or um, well, I love Billy Elliot, but but the section of Billy Elliot where they're in solidarity and it's the, the ballet dancers crossing over with the miners. Mm-hmm. I look at that and I go, that's almost five perfect minutes of theatre that I wish I wish that had been my work because <laughs> I'm arrogant enough to go. I think I would have done it very similarly to that but but then you go but i can't but i can't say that anymore because they did it <laughs> and i go, um and i've got a similar thing with the whole of avenue q which i love mm. which i've been approached to direct before and and i get to a point where i go i i just can't with that show i love the show i would love to do the show but i also go i don't know what i could possibly do yeah that would improve on what they did um, i've had it recently with come from i think the whole of come from away is mm-hmm. is just so beautifully conceived and directed so so yeah so it's not so much shows that i there are shows that i'm jealous that i wasn't on but then arrogantly also go <laughs> i'm jealous i wasn't on it but also didn't do it exactly the way it was done <laughs> nice another correct answer <laughs> yeah there's also there's also many many shows that i'll watch it and go Oh, I wish I'd done that one. I would have done it completely differently. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen those before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number three, and the most important question. Food in the theater or cell phones in the theater? Which is worse? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I think it has to be cell phones just on the fact that food is annoying but 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 you can kind of cope with food packets and things a phone ringing if phones phones didn't ring i'd say have every phone you want and certainly i think what six has shown is film the last 10 minutes of a show or five minutes of a show and that certainly helps spread the word but a phone a phone ringing in the theater is pretty much the 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 worst (laughs) moment that exists I, i think i think i would put up with a rustling packet of chips over the phone i'm not too sure they both annoy me <laughs> that is the correct answer right, right. <laughs> <Why are you? laughs> so, another correct answer no problem that's three, three. congratulations oh thank you thank you <laughs> again neil thank you so much for uh, taking some time out and talking to us today that's thanks a lot it's been really fun thanks for that no problem. All right. We were speaking with a Neil Gooding uh, producer and director here on uh, Be Our Guest. Uh, tune in next week as we'll be speaking with another guest or guests about their life, love, and passion that is musical theater. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanov. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you. <laughs>